Hello everybody, it's Laura Husband here from Hairdressers Journal International. Um, welcome to today's HJ Goes Live session. I'm sure it's going to be an informative session for all hairdressers tuning in. So we're going to be talking about hairdressing posture for a long and healthy career, which I'm sure everybody wants. And we've got the amazing Andrew Carruthers with us here today, who's the Education Director at Sam Via. I practiced saying his name beforehand and I'm hopefully, I'm hopefully I've got it spot on for you there, Andrew. It's great to have you with us today. It's good to be here for sure. Very Amazing. Happy. And where are you tuning in from for us today, Andrew? I live in a small town in Southern Oregon. So I'm, I'm in the hills of Southern Oregon. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I live in the trees. <laughs> oh, fantastic. We, we started a conversation before going live about the different situations with COVID in the UK compared to America, didn't we? Um, yeah. I think, yeah, exactly, which is a conversation all in itself. But today, as I say, we're talking about a topic which is relevant across borders, isn't it? And that is making sure you've got that correct posture for keeping yourself healthy while working behind the chair. So are you going to be doing, do you, before we kick off actually, Andrew, do you want to tell us a bit about yourself so people understand your background and your expertise in this, this specific field? For sure, yeah. I've been a, I've been a hairdresser for 21 years. I, I started <clears throat> back in Salt Lake City, Utah, I apprenticed under a guy that was the regional education director for TG. So my first beginnings were kind of in the TG world um, and I got turned on to education pretty much straight off because Tyson, he needed help with teaching product knowledge classes in just around town. And so before I even had a hair license, I was out teaching like those classes. It's like, oh, here's so-and-so shampoo and it's got vitamins, dot, dot, dot in it. But what was cool is that was the first thing that really um, caught me as far as being a teacher because just seeing how people uh, um, just that light that turns on within people when they learn something new was really powerful for me. So um, I was also the education or artistic director for Paul Mitchell Advanced Education, which was in charge of training uh, all the Paul Mitchell schools. And then about seven years ago, I met Sam Via and we became just really close and um, it was just perfect timing because I was a salon owner at the time, which I absolutely was not meant to be a salon owner. <laughs> <laughs> so meeting Sam and getting to come back into full-time education was really important. But a lot of like what we're going to talk about today actually comes from a lot of my study of yoga and Pilates and um, lots of different different physical therapy forms I went through. So um, yeah, a big focus for today is going to be experience behind the chair definitely going through my own aches and pains, you know, and trying to find solutions for those aches and pains, but they're very much informed by especially the last couple of years that I've been studying a different yoga form. And um, so it's all going to get kind of mashed together today. Amazing. Well, we're excited for it, Andrew. So um, should I just let you get started then? Sure. Yeah. I'm happy Brilliant. to jump in. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Laura. You're so um, <clears throat> yeah, what I'd love for you guys to do, if, if you're somewhere that you can actually stand up right now, I'd love for you to just stand up. Or if you're sitting, that's okay too. But the first thing I want you to do is I want you to just kind of start to find your feet. So just bring all your attention into the soles of your feet. And before you do anything, just kind of take notice to how the weight is within your feet. And what you can do is you can imagine this is my foot Imagine a line that starts at your pinky toe and goes to the inside of your heel, the back inside of your heel. So it's crossing across your back of your heel. And then imagine another line that goes from the big toe, which would, I guess, be more up here, <laughs> and goes <laughs> to the outside of the foot. And just imagine that little X across the bottom of your foot. Within that X, where is the weight in your feet? Are you maybe kind of like putting the weight on the outside edges of the feet? Are you someone that kind of stands with the weight on the inside of the feet? Maybe you kind of feel like you're up on your toes. You might feel like you're kind of rocked back into your heels. But the goal is, <clears throat> excuse me, the goal is, is to make sure that you get the weight even within your feet. Because once the, feet, once the weight is even within your feet, you're probably standing in a pretty balanced position. Most of what happens within our body, like the aches and the pains and all of these things that happen, 
most of it is because we just haven't been standing properly and taking care of our body properly. So um, the first thing we can check in on when we get to the salon is just kind of just kind of settle into our feet, make sure our hips are right above our feet, our shoulders are above our hips, our head is above our shoulders. And what I mean by that, if you look from a profile, one of the things that's really common as hairdressers is this. Mm -hmm. I promise you, if you look around your salon, you're going to see a lot of this, which is hips forward, head kind of tipped forward, and the chest is kind of like back, but sort of like shoulders forward. Let us know, anyone who's tuning in, let us know if that if that stance and um, rings a bell with you that Andrew was just doing for us. Yeah, stay interactive with us, guys. And yeah, pop into the chats because Laura's going to monitor those chats. If you have any questions as we're talking, please feel free to jump in and ask questions. So the reason, Laura, we kind of get into these positions is because as hairdressers, we want to really control this piece of air, right? So we start to do this. You know, like we get really close, our head collapses down and forward. And because the client is typically not this high, of course, they're more down here. And this might even be kind of high. That's where we kind of start to do this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. We kind of tuck down. So we just have to be really attentive and remember that the chair goes up and down, the chair spins, and hey, our body moves. <laughs> <laughs> The big thing that we see when we're in salons coaching is people doing these kind of motions to cut hair. And it's like, well, remember your feet move, remember the chair moves and put yourself and your clients into better positions to, to stay balanced over your feet. So um, that's kind of the first thing. Great. From there, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> And from there, we want to kind of explore what happens within our hands, what happens within our shoulders, what happens within even our, um, like the connection of the shoulders mm -hmm. into the neck. So the one thing too, or I want to make sure that we touch on is at Sambia, we truly believe that there's no such thing as a right way to do things and a wrong way to do things. There's just knowledge. So please understand there might be some things I share with you today that might challenge some of your belief systems as a hairdresser, because we get really locked into our belief systems, depending on especially where we were trained, right, Laura? Like we get in and if we have a certain teacher that's like, this is the right way, this is the only way, we get pretty locked into like, oh, okay, this is the way I have to do things. And so at Sam Via, our big thing is we're just the messenger. We're just here to share information with you and your job then is to start to explore and to test these different things. You know, we believe you should test everything that you're told. Like we shouldn't just take it as truth. We should test it and try it out and just see, okay, what's most beneficial for us. So Andrew, I mean, that's interesting actually. So would you recommend testing out some of these positions and postures? Obviously you've got a dummy with you today. Would you recommend anyone tuning in who wants to try a different angle to try it on a dummy first? before doing it straight onto a client in the salon? Oh, for sure. I mean, <laughs> Sam and I always <laughs> say this, we're like, yeah, we work out all the time. We work out with these girls. <laughs> <laughs> this is something yeah. after 21 years and Sam's got 40 some odd years in the industry. We are still taking time with mannequin heads on a regular mm -hmm. basis. And a lot of people kind of poo poo on uh, you know, the mannequin head thing because they're like, well, it's not a real human. But this is your opportunity to test. This is your opportunity to challenge those things that maybe you're not real comfortable challenging those, challenging those belief systems on a real client because there's more risk there, right? Like she doesn't cry if I mess up her hair. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and she's not sitting in the chair judging me and going, come on, it's you know 5.30, I gotta get to my appointment, next appointment. So yeah, we believe that having a closet full of these and a nice mannequin stand it's, it's one of the hairdresser's best tools for sure. Um, silly question, Andrew, but um, because we're obviously talking about posture and finding the best ways to stand and position yourself, would you experiment with putting the mannequin head on a chair, on your salon chair and playing around with it that way? Sure. Yeah, there's actually, I've seen mannequin stands that slide over the back of a chair. And so you could do that, which would pretty much replicate exactly what you're going to experience in the salon. 
but if you're doing it at home, that might not be you know, <laughs> realistic to have a salon chair at home. Some people do, but um, yeah. That's so true. you might have to wait, wait till out of hours once all the clients have gone and then have a little experiment. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah do your workout before you go home. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> so let's, um, let's talk about hands. And, you know, if you are a hairdresser, that is already experiencing some pain in your hand, just type a, that's me, into the chat. Just say, that's me. Because this is 100% one of the first things that people have challenges with is hands, wrists. Mm -hmm. So we're really gonna focus in on shear control and how to get more balance and looseness into the hands and wrists. So that we um, just um, are careful about how, how we're treating our hands, because these are really important tools. Like this is everything as a hairdresser is our hands, right? So if these go, career's over. Yeah. So yeah, if you're someone that's already experiencing some pain, just type yes into the chat. So one thing, Laura, I'm just gonna like take a little side note too, is a lot of people experience carpal tunnel. So, one thing that I just want, want to tell you from personal experience, if you are diagnosed with carpal tunnel, the first thing that you should do is also ask them about your neck. Because I almost went in for carpal tunnel surgery. I went to a different, different physical therapist before I went in for surgery. And she found it had nothing to do with my wrist. It was actually a pinched nerve in my neck. So a pinched nerve in the neck can replicate that same feeling because that nerve, if it's the right nerve, it travels down through here, through your shoulder, into the back, and it goes through your underarm, down through your elbow, and into your wrist. So I was having the exact same symptoms that they call carpal tunnel, numbness in the hand, pain here in, in inside of the elbow, pain in the, the shoulder. It wasn't carpal tunnel. It was actually a pinched nerve. Wow. And she told me that like 50% of carpal tunnel surgeries don't work because it wasn't carpal mm -hmm. tunnel. So and was, just and was, a little that, side note. No, definitely, Andrew. And was the pinched neck caused by working as a hairdresser? 100%. Mm. Going back to that position, Laura, that we talked about, which was this, that head tipped forward all the time. Mm -hmm. The disc actually had slipped slightly forward here. And that's part of the reason that like the yoga that I do now is so incredibly essential because if the lower body is strong and has a support, the neck can actually relax. Like the neck and shoulders can soften. And that was a big part of it. You can kind of still see from the side, I still kind of have that slight shift forward in my neck, even if I'm standing as natural as possible. So you just, just really have to be careful with their necks as hairdressers. How many, how many years did you work as a hairdresser, Andrew, before you found all of these good posture um, tips and suggestions that change the way that you work? Um, I would say it was probably, it was a good like seven or eight years into mm -hmm. it that I finally, because and a lot of it came from because I was starting to experience pain mm -hmm. that I started to explore like went to physical therapists, went to doctors. And it took a long time though of, of going through different physical therapy modalities and different doctors. And, you know, everyone kind of has a different method. And it wasn't until kind of four or five different people later that she was the one that diagnosed that it was because of the neck, because everyone else kept trying to work on my shoulder, work on my arm, work on my wrist. And I had nothing to do with that. So kind of crazy. So you're proof though that there is there is um, a recipe to correcting correcting the issues. If someone's tuning in who's been a hairdresser for 30 odd years or whatever, there is a recipe to try and make things better. 100%. I think one of the greatest mindset shifts that we can make is you are never broken. You are always in a position to come back. Because I think that's one of the, the messages that we hear all the time is broken and like we need fixed and all these things. Mm -hmm. Once we get into that mindset that we're broken, it's really difficult to heal. So we just have to come back to that place that even if you're in pain, even if your posture is bad, you have the opportunity to come back from it. 
is it going to take work? Is it going to take dedication? Is it going to maybe take even a few years? A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely taken a year and a half to two years of pretty focused work over the last two years to get to a point where I can honestly say a hundred percent I'm pain free. Like I have zero pain in my body anymore. Now that wasn't true two years ago. So yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, even for those of you 30 years in, you can yeah. still heal. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, and you were talking about the hands, weren't you, um, Andrew, yeah. and the importance of looking after your hands as a hairdresser. Yeah. Did you, do so, you have any tips from that point of view? Yeah, the first thing is I really want to kind of focus in on how we even hold our shears. So, um, and this isn't necessarily to market our shears. This is just to kind of give you an idea of, of shears. So um, naturally, or traditionally, this is the way a shear is shaped. Let's get that in the center. Where the thumb and the finger are right over top of each other. So this type of shear position puts our natural hand position, which is this, into a little bit of a challenging place because there's the, the finger Focus, camera, come on. And then my thumb has to come all the way back here to, to kind of get into position. So our natural hand position is actually more like this. So to get this thumb to go back, look at how much we have to squeeze that back. Look at what that's done to your hand. Mm -hmm. So we just have to be understanding about that because you know, there's lots of shears that have just a slight forward set. There's lots of shears now that have what's called a crane handle. This is our shear. It has a forward set thumb. Let me, I'm going to check one thing on my camera here. I'm sorry. It's not wanting to focus. I'm just going to say hello to Dina, who's tuning in from Shetland in the UK. It's lovely to have you with us, Dina. And Julie, Hi, Dina. Julie wants to say um, how much she loves um, Sam Via and all of the team, including yourself, Andrew. So... Thank a you couple so of shout outs going on there. <laughs> Very cool. Thank you. I love it. I love hearing that. Okay, so now we'll get focused. There we go. Okay, so you can see the difference with a very far forward set thumb versus an even set. So if you look, what this does is it takes, here's my natural hand position. I'm not squeezing this all the way back here to get my thumb in. Mm -hmm. It's a much more natural and relaxed hand position. So again, this isn't like to market our shear. This is to just give you an idea that there's lots of shear companies out there making more ergonomically shaped shears. And it's something that it will feel incredibly uncomfortable at first if you've been using this style of shear, but especially if you're uh, someone that's starting to experience hand pain. I'd, I, we'd highly encourage just check into forward or more offset or forward set kind of shapes of shears. Because the other are they, thing- are they, the, the, are they the buzzwords, Andrew, to look out for? Oh, what mm -hmm. was it? Um, forward set or offset? Yeah, so you have, this is even set. So from even set, they'll take the thumb and shift it just a little bit off, which mm -hmm. is offset. And then our shear is actually forward set. So it actually moves that pretty far forward. Mm. The other thing too is actually the shape of the handle. See how it almost looks like the handle's bent downward yeah. slightly? So again, what that's for is to put your body in a more ergonomic position because with that set like that, we don't have to have our elbow up in the air as much to cut, mm. which this is where I'm gonna probably start to test some belief systems because <laughs> I know, um, you know, within certain haircutting structures were taught that this is proper body position. In fact, this is what we used to teach within uh, Palm Beach of the school. So um, <laughs> the thing is, is yes, could this potentially be more beneficial from a, a very strictly technical aspect? So if I'm in a diagonal section, is it best to have my elbows like this to cut that section? from a purely technical standpoint, possibly. But mm -hmm. we have to understand that every decision that we make as hairdressers has a benefit to it, but it also has a compromise. There's no perfect decision. So the benefit of doing body position like this might be maybe technical accuracy, 
but look at the compromise in my body. How long mm -hmm. can we stand with this body position? That's gonna be pretty tough on our body. Mm -hmm. So the shape of your shear actually matters with that because if you look with a non-offset, with an even set shear, when I put my hand in here, watch what has to kind of happen with my elbow to keep my wrist straight. If I wanna drop my elbow, look at what kind of has to happen with my wrist. Not good. This isn't healthy mm. as far as and that, comics. And that looks like it's not as good for the arm either. Correct. So it's not just hand and wrist, it's mm. actually our arm too. So if you look at a forward set, with that crane style handle, it's very natural. And if I turn to the side, look at my wrist too. Just really natural positioning. And I can keep my body in a more natural state when I'm cutting. Mm -hmm. So again, not the right thing, not the wrong thing, just just knowledge to test. No. And, to and, I, and I guess that might feel unnatural to begin with if you're used to cutting the other way. Oh my gosh. So for pretty much, let's see, I met Sam uh, for 14 years of my career, I held a shirt like this, even set, and was taught very much that this was proper body positioning. And so when I started working with Sam and he put a forward set shear in my hand, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so weird. <laughs> We actually even send out a video with our shears that tells people you'll actually probably feel sore at first. Right. Like it'll probably almost seem like it's not working mm. because you're training new muscles. You're changing the, the structure of the muscles in your hands to change in a different way. But the thing is, is once you adapt to a more natural position, uh, it feels really good. Mm. And by the way, I was always kind of taught that these were goofy. <laughs> and so I had a real attitude about swivel thumb shears, Laura, when, when I first started working with Sam and he's like, <laughs> have you ever used one? And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, well, I would like for you to try them and see if there's something there that you might think is interesting. This can be a huge lifesaver, honestly, especially for people that already are having wrist and hand problems. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll show you a couple hand positions because I like to kind of talk about what we started to talk about, which is like kind of shoulder and hand position now. Mm -hmm. And swivel shears are pretty brilliant for this kind of stuff. So probably one of the most compromising positions that we get ourselves into is like those little graduated bobs where we have to really tuck our hands tight into the head, especially because when we have the head low, it's really difficult to get our hand position in there. So we see people putting their bodies into some really funky positions to be able to do these little graduated bobs. So um, just as kind of an example, Laura, typically when we're doing these kind of shapes, we're down here in the nape of the neck. And so what a lot of times we see it is we're trying to cut this nice little graduated shape. Our fingers are tucked really deep into the head. And so when we pick up the shear, when we have a shear in our hand, especially a non-swivel thumb shear, what ends up happening, we've been taught to cut palm to palm. And so this is what we see people in pretty often, cutting these little graduated bobs. And that looks very awkward and very uncomfortable as a non-hairdresser. Yes. I would say that that doesn't look like the best position to be in. No. And even if you kind of get away from the palm to palm position, if you go backhand to palm, mm -hmm. even this, unless you get really elbows super high, which is going to put stress into the shoulder to get the, the wrist straight, this is a little better for wrist, but look how elevated I have to get that shoulder up. So um, this is one place that when I show this in classes, when we show this in classes, people just kind of trip out because this is where that swivel shear really comes in handy. So instead of going here or going all the way up here, I can actually just drop my shoulder and just hit my hand just adapts to the shape of the shear. And it yeah. now look at how natural I can stand. And the wrist can stay in a pretty neutral position now and just let the shear create the angle. 
So that's where swivel thumb shears actually do come in super, super handy, especially for people that are already experiencing wrist problems. Does that give you more control as well, not having to have your elbow and your arm so high up? Well, our opinion, yes. Mm -hmm. That's probably the part that people would challenge that mm -hmm. opinion <laughs> is that <laughs> people have been trained to cut this way because we've been taught that if we get our whole upper body parallel with the cutting line, mm -hmm. that that's more precision. Right. And again, like if that, if that fits what you want within your hairdressing career, we would never tell you you're wrong. It's just maybe to also take a look at what it's doing to the body. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's, pra it's practice as well, I guess, Sam, seeing what works for you, whether you can get the same precision by changing your angle. A hundred percent. And that's what we would suggest that you test. Like that's why testing these things is so important because for every person, it's going to be slightly different. We definitely know people. In fact, next year we are going to come out with another line of shears that don't have quite as forward set of a thumb because we've had a couple people that are like, you know, I just can't get used to that forward set of a thumb. So we're like, you know what, that's cool. Like you still wanna play and you still want to work with us. So we'll do something that's a little less. It'll still be ergonomically positive, but not quite as forward set of a thumb because mm -hmm. it doesn't work for everyone. And there is, there is a way, Laura, that you can modify your hand position within a shear that doesn't have a swivel. So this shear does not have a swivel on it. So what you can do instead of kind of coming up here to get your wrist straight or going to here is you can actually take the thumb out and you can pop it in the other side. So this would be the natural position or not natural, but this would be our normal cutting position. So all you have to do is take the thumb out, drop the hand down keep the wrist straight and pop the thumb in the opposite side. Then you can get into some of those positions again. This also works great for cutting one length hair if we want to get down low. Brilliant. So, and can you do that with any pair of scissors, that change of the thumb position? 100%. Yeah. Here, so that's that's, that's, a, tip, that's a tip that anybody tuning in could literally try on a dummy head tomorrow with the scissors that they've got. Yeah. And like, here's just a traditional even set shear. Mm -hmm. You can definitely do that with this too. You just take the thumb out, pop the thumb in the opposite side. Brilliant. Yeah, so that's something you can play around with. And it'll feel super, super awkward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like we were saying earlier, for anyone who missed the beginning part, it's always a good idea to experiment with these new, idea new ideas with a mannequin first rather than your, your next client. <laughs> yeah, and if we have any students watching out there, and even if you're not a student, one of the things that we would say highly suggest is just Take time to get muscle memory into your hands. So uh, one thing I, sorry, just to kind of step back because I kind of forgot to talk about this. One thing that will also help you is how you're holding your actual shear. So if the shear slides, let's see if it goes this way. If the shear slides kind of back into this position into our hand and the thumb is lodged in there, we don't have much room to play. And it also tends to turn us into quackers <laughs> where the top and bottom go at the same time. What we really want to do is we want to keep the shear not going past that first knuckle and the thumb just kind of gently rests into the thumb hole. You'll see it's not, let me see how close I can get. You can see that it's not actually filling the actual thumb hole there. It stays just kind of rested into there so that way, what happens is we can isolate the thumb, which is great for control. But then the other thing too, is from a side view here, you can see I can actually rotate this into a lot of different positions without changing my wrist position. So it kind of takes a regular thumb shear, gives you a more wide range of motion, more similar to a swivel shear. So this is something, if you, if you have time, you know, get out the Netflix and the popcorn, maybe a glass of wine, put this in the <laughs> other hand and just do this. Brilliant. And we've had a few people asking actually, um, Andrew, for the name of that, of the scissor. 
Yeah, sure. Um, so if you go to samvia.com, these are the uh, streamline series here. We have quite a few different series. This is the streamline. You'll see within our signature, our streamline, our essential series and our artist series, they all have that same shape. The handle is slightly different. So this one on the right here, I think that's on your right. <clears throat> it's on my right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, on my left, on my left, yeah. Okay, yes, on your left, I apologize. So this one's our signature series handle. So you can see that the thumb and finger holes are actually quite big. So this mm -hmm. one has kind of a bigger feel to it. So you have larger hands, bigger fingers. This, the signature series handle probably will fit you great. If you have smaller hands, <clears throat> which I actually don't have smaller hands, I have quite big hands. But I actually prefer the streamline still because it has just kind of a slightly smaller grip to it. And it has like super, super sculpted and finger and thumb holes to it. it give you just a ton of range of motion. Brilliant. So for anyone who was asking um, for the name of the scissor, there you go. And do you have more tips, Andrew, for people that maybe um, can't afford to make an investment in a new pair of scissors, but just want to make sure that they do improve their posture? Um, with yeah, the tools that they're already working with as well. Yeah, so if we go back to just like an even set kind of shear, mm -hmm. exactly what we just showed, shared with you too, as far as like keeping this up more in your fingertips. So you can see even with an even set shear, if I keep my my shear in not past that first knuckle, I have a little bit more range of motion to get the shear into a better position without compromising my wrist. So um, by keeping it up into your fingertips, you can kind of get this into a position that might keep your thumb a little bit more neutral, but you're just going to have to play around with it a little bit. Mm. So um, exact same exercise, that's going to help you quite a bit. Brilliant. So again, with Netflix, with your existing scissors, you can play around with the movements you can make without having to move your hands too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Fantastic. And do you have any tips in terms of kind of, we've spoken a bit about obviously the hands um, and the issues with the neck, but in, in the people that are struggling with their arms as well and their backs? Yes, for sure. So a big part of, again, kind of going back to what we were taught, which is to keep our body position parallel with our sections, keep our elbows up and things like that. That's what really gets into like the shoulder and back issues. Because, you know, we were taught that if you're in a vertical section, let's say you're cutting a nice layered haircut, let me put her a little bit lower. If you're cutting a nice layered haircut and you're in a vertical, vertical section, that this would be your positioning. Well, again, could this be more um, technically accurate? Possibly. How long can this last though? Because mm -hmm. if you're sitting at home right now, just take your elbow and pick it up. Hold it there just for a second. Bring your awareness into your entire upper body, not just your arm, not just your shoulder, but check in on I'm what's gonna, actually I'm gonna happening. do this as well, Andrew. Yeah, do it, please. Don't Notice what's too. happening in your neck right now. You're probably getting super stiff and tight within your neck. Even your low back could start to feel ah, a little tight yeah. because you're, you're, what you're doing is you're throwing your whole upper body out of natural position. So mm -hmm. as much as possible, we wanna try and keep that natural body position where it's neutral. So as much as possible, if you're on the sides of the head working, most of the time, what we found is most of the time, cutting in hand is probably going to keep you most neutral. That changes once we get to the top of the head because now we're kind of getting up here and that could put us in an awkward body position. But anytime we're working on the sides and back of the head, most of the time, keeping the elbow down is going to keep our body position more neutral. So here, with the elbow down, my neck can stay neutral, my back can stay neutral. Then as we start to get to the top of the head, then taking more of an overhand position keeps us more natural and neutral too. Because if I'm cutting the section on the top of the head, I can keep my elbows just relaxed, keep stress out of the neck. So, so our recommendation is first on the sides and back of the head, keep fingers, uh, keep 
palm towards you, fingers up as much as possible. Once we get to the top of the head, palm down. That'd be our recommendation mm -hmm. to play with. Um, but there'll be, of course, exceptions like um, DJ Muldoon, one of our good friends, he, he was showing this haircut and he was on the back of the head and he's doing this really cool little undercut technique where it's cut super short at the at the top of the section to really long at the at the ends. And so for that, trying to do that in palm would be quite difficult, right? So at that point, yeah, it makes way more sense to be in a position of overhand because that is much more natural of a cutting position than this. So there's always exceptions and that's what we really have to play with. And I love what you kind of keep reinforcing, Laura. Get yourself a mannequin head and just go through this stuff. My, the guy that apprenticed me, I used to hate him for this, but I love him for this now. But what he used to do when I was apprenticing, he wouldn't let me pick these up. He says, what, what you're gonna do is you're gonna go into the back room, you're gonna set up your mannequin head and here are three different haircuts. I want you to go through the partings of these three different haircuts and the hand positions of these three different haircuts. I want you to do it three times each. So, okay, I'm gonna do a graduate bob, center vertical section, horizontal section, diagonal forward sections. And he's like, just examine how your body is with each of those sections. Just look at how your body position is without even cutting hair. But this is, this is not something that people tend to take time with. Right. Cause it's not as fun honestly you know I we think, want to see it yeah more. exactly and i think this has been invaluable for the people tuning in because they're taking the time to look at your position that you're mm -hmm. making throughout whereas normally they'd be concentrating on the cut you were doing as opposed to your body which we're obviously focusing on for this session um yeah. so i've noticed myself how that all of those awkward positions they look they look really uncomfortable and quite painful but you probably don't realize it when you do it day in day out <laughs> And that's the thing, like this stuff, there's a there's a, a saying that things happen slowly, then they happen suddenly. That is very true for body pain. Very slowly, you keep doing this kind of stuff all day long and putting yourself in awkward body positions. Slowly, something is happening. Something is deteriorating. Something is collapsing within your, within your body structure suddenly you're going to wake up in the morning and you're going to roll over to hit the alarm clock and you're going to go, oh, oh my gosh, what just happened? I can't believe I just hurt myself hitting my alarm clock. You didn't just hurt yourself hitting your alarm clock. You have been slowly building up to that moment for years and years and years based on what you've been doing every day of your life. So um, that's what we have to take notice of, especially again, if there's students watching, if you can adopt these things now, and not wait till 20 years down the line when you're worried about carpal tunnel surgery and worried, worried about back surgery, you're going to be in a lot better place. Definitely. And Andrew, do you have any tips for anyone who has developed bad habits and how to kind of consciously shake them off? Yeah, absolutely. So um, this comes into um, my coaching studies because we can, we kind of have to talk about how the, the brain itself works. So um, <clears throat> Somewhere between 90 to 95% of your day is completely unconscious. I know that sounds really weird, but 90 to 95% of your day is run by your unconscious part of your brain. It's just all patterns. So Laura, it's why you can get to work and not think about a single step of it because you've repeated that process enough that it's become habit, it's become unconscious. And so your competence is completely unconscious. You don't have to think about it. So the brain, it uses a ton less, uh, that's not a right way to say it, <laughs> it uses a lot less energy to run from our unconscious programs than to make conscious decisions. Mm -hmm. So there's this part of the brain up here called the prefrontal cortex. This is the decision-making part of our brain, but it requires a ton of energy. So when we're cutting hair, especially after we're, we've been doing it for quite a while, 90% probably of your haircut is completely unconscious. You're probably not actually thinking, okay, clean vertical section, vertical finger angle, 
good tension, sheer position, hand position, lower body position, arm position, you're not going through those check marks anymore. Maybe you are first thing in school. So um, the reason that's important to understand is because everything that you're doing, those habits, it's just patterns that you've created. You've done a great job of creating patterns already, create new patterns, but creating new patterns has to be a conscious decision. Because if you get into the salon, you're super busy. The brain's natural thing is you're going to get through a haircut and you're going to go, crap, I didn't even, I didn't do anything different. Did it, did it the old way. <laughs> the same things that I always do. Why did I forget? <laughs> it's your natural tendency to go back to those habits because it requires less energy. So you have to create some kind of reminder system, Laura. It could be as simple as just grabbing a little post-it note, just put it next to you on your station. So each time you kind of put your comb down or you pick up a clip or something like that, that's in view. And it, maybe it just says, check your body position. So, oh yeah, okay, got to remember, check my body position. Mm -hmm. But we have to have those regular reminders mm -hmm. to create those new scripts, those new um, habits. That's a very good idea to just have that little post-it note or something on your, your kit bag trolley or something. Um, yeah just to remind you to kind of keep checking yourself. That's a great tip. Yeah. And kind of the final, the Do you final have any, piece. Um, Go ahead, Laura. Oh yeah, no, I was just gonna say if there's any exercises or tips you can give. I don't know if that's what you're about to go on to there or not. Was it, was it Andrew? Oh, perfect. Well, kind of. So the last, the last kind of piece of the puzzle, because we've talked about like the hands and wrists and shoulders and upper body, the last piece of the puzzle is what happens from here down. Oh, and this yeah. is such an important piece to the puzzle because kind of going back to that thing, if you're not balanced in your feet, everything above the hips is going to have a hard time getting into balance as well. So it's really important that we focus on the lower body and one of the things we have to remember within our hairdressing and within our hair cutting, especially, is the feet are our ability to move around the head. And so if you think about it, hairdressers, if we pick up a section of hair and we move our feet, what movement in hairdressing are we doing? Type that into the chat. Because I know we're getting a little short on time, I'll answer it for you. <laughs> it's over direction. So your feet are actually in charge of upward direction within your haircut, because one of the things we should get in a habit of doing is always just putting that hair into a nice natural place. Then to over direct the hair, instead of doing something like that, which throws us out of balance. Oh, simple, yes. We just move our body. Yeah. Yeah. How easy is that? Put our and you body- get, you get a few more, um, And get a few more steps on your, your Fitbit or your Apple Watch, whatever it is you're using. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so as far as specific exercises, um, the one thing that like the entire yoga system that I've been practicing for the last about two years, it has everything to do with building great structure from the hips down. Because a lot of times in yoga, the first thing we do is go into all these floor movements and stuff, but we haven't built structure into our body yet. So I'd highly recommend looking into just building good structure from the hips down as a hairdresser. Um, everything up here is kind of our vanity muscles. So especially when we go to the gym and stuff, we kind of tend to do lots of bench press or like curls or something so we can have like the vanity muscles. But really what's happening from here down, that's what builds the structure to support all this. We kind of forget about that. So just squats, honestly, are fantastic but have someone teach you how to do those things properly. Cause there's, if you're doing squats in a weird way. It's gonna make your back, <laughs> back even worse, I'm guessing. <laughs> you're not helping yourself. No. So, um, it, it's important to learn those things um, from it's a like, proper. If, perfect. Cause if somebody wanted to invest in specific types of exercises, whether that's through a personal trainer or doing a class or something like that, what types of classes or exercises should they be? You mentioned squats there. Are there any other mm -hmm. specific ones that they should be concentrating on? Um, I mean, good core strength is a good thing to have, but I think just based on my recent trainings mm -hmm. that I've gone through, 
embarrassing that we kind of overdo things for for core. Uh, really, if you don't have good strong legs, that too much core exercise can actually throw you out of balance. So, you know, doing things that are actually full body, like um, burpees, for example, like if you want to get a great exercise, look at things that are full range of motion. So things like burpees, uh, there's, I think they call them Turkish get-ups. <laughs> <laughs> these movements that take you through very natural body movements that we do as humans. But looking at kind of full body health versus just mm -hmm. isolated motions like curls and stuff, like I said, they're great for vanity muscles, but they're not really necessarily helping us to just have a healthy structure. Mm -hmm. it, and I'll say that with, that is opinion of some. Of course, of course. Now that's that's great, Andrew. And we and someone has actually asked us, um, what's the discipline of yoga that you choose to practice to help you with your, um, you know, making sure you've got the right postures from a hairdressing point of view. Brilliant. Thank you for asking. Um, so it's called shadow yoga. Um, shadow, like the shadow, you know, is behind me because the light is on my front. But shadow yoga is the principle. It's based on. Uh, pretty much the original Hatha yoga. Um, there's a lot of yoga out there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've definitely learned over the last two years that a lot of it is um, not actually yoga. It's just exercise <laughs> and stretching. <laughs> and so uh, definitely check into kind of where the yoga has come from um, before you practice, I think is a good thing and make sure it's something that fits fits your uh, fits who you are. Shadow yoga has a very spiritual aspect to it too, which is important for me personally. And so I'm definitely something to check, check out shadow yoga. And based on Hatha yoga, that's a great, great tip as well there, Andrew. Brilliant. Well, I think we're coming to a, a wrap in terms of this session. So um, are there any sort of final words or final tips that you wanted to share, Andrew, before we wrap up? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's kind of beating a dead horse because we've said it so many mm -hmm. times, but just again, remember, there's no right way and there's no wrong way to do things. It's so important and, it, and it's part of your essence, essence as a human being that you have the right and the ability to make things your own. So learn from lots of people, like definitely have your mentors and have your structures and follow those things, but also test them, play with them, have fun. Like you questioning something isn't you being um, insolent against your education. Mm -hmm. It's just you making it yours. And it's mm -hmm. so important. Like we used to sing in Paul Mitchell, the school that you have this carpet bag with you. And what's important about that bag is everywhere you go, you pick up that piece that seems like truth and you put it into your bag. That's what makes you you. Like I'm a very different hairdresser than Sam himself, but I've picked up things from him. Mm -hmm. I've picked up things from you know, people from all over the place. And that's what makes me me. Mm -hmm. So just continue to play with these things and, and just, um, yeah, just don't accept that concept that this, this is the right way and this is the wrong way. That's a great tip. I think that's a great way to end it, Andrew, actually, isn't it? Because just because it's considered the right way, maybe from a technical point of view, doesn't mean it's going to help you in your career from a health point of view in the long term. 100%. And like you said earlier, which is um, which I've really taken from this as well, is that it's never too late to make these changes. Yeah, absolutely. And just again, guys, on every level, I know there's a lot of hard things going on out there. You are not broken. We are not broken. Mm -hmm. As a community, as a society, as a planet, we're not broken. Mm -hmm. We have some things we have to do differently, but we have to get away from this concept that we're broken. You are a whole. Oh, fantastic. It's a great way to end it. Thank you so much, Andrew. And if anybody wants to um, get any more info from you in terms of posture and um, tips for kind of a healthy long career, how can they um, how can they reach you? So, of course, you can go to sambia.com. There's contact information through sambia.com. I would highly recommend you join us on all our social channels. So on Instagram, you can find us just type in sambia, Facebook, type in sambia. YouTube, our YouTube channel has so much content on it. I think we have 600 videos on there at oh, this wow. point. <laughs> so if you need education, go to YouTube, type, type in Sam Villa, V-I-L-L-A, and you're going to get tons of education. 
if you want to connect with me directly, you're always welcome to reach out. I'm pretty good at returning messages and stuff. And it's just andrew.carruthers. Um, the last name is C-A-R-R-U-T-H-E-R-S. Perfect. So I'm sure there'll be some people that will be tuning into this after we've gone live and might well have had a specific question that we weren't able to answer. So um, thank you so much for sharing your Instagram details as well. You might get some DMs from people saying, help me, I've got a specific back issue or arm issue or wrist issue or something um, that awesome. they want your advice on, which would be fantastic. Please do. I'd be happy to help. Brilliant. Well, thank you. Have a great day, Andrew. It's morning there for you, isn't it? So you've got the rest of the day ahead of you. And you probably noticed it's got darker and darker where I am <laughs> while we've been doing this live. So I hope everyone has a great evening in the UK as well. We look forward to seeing you all soon. Many thanks again, Andrew. Thank you, Laura. I appreciate it. Take care. Bye.